message and he knows who's here. And for those that aren't here, praise God, you're going to get it anyway. Hallelujah. In the midst of all the healing and, and, and the being set free over this last many months, how many know we've been healed, delivered, and set free of, of monumental things over the last months? All of us. I mean, we're getting set free, and in the midst of getting set free, we get set free of something else. And God gave me this title, and I began to get it ready for the school tonight. And God told me, he said, I don't want it for school, I want it for Sunday morning. What's happening in our life right now is we're breaking free. Breakthrough means you're breaking free. But God said he wants us to break free from the cycle of pain. And what I mean by a cycle of pain, it's like it's got a certain cycle in our lives. That when we get to a certain place, it, it, it opens that wound again. And I, I know some of you probably think, oh, there can't be anything left. But I'm here to tell you. If God gave me a sermon this morning for those that are here this morning, how many know it must be for us? We got to give him a, a, a place in our life that separates you from everything you have desired. We got to separate from everything we've desired in the natural. How many know everything you liked at one time in your life is not any, even anything anymore? Come on. What was important to me 10 years ago it doesn't even have a remote clue to me anymore. I mean, it's not even anything to me now. It's in turn, I tell you, is, is an open door a lot of times if we have some, something in our life to where that separates us from God, it's a demonic oppression to you. If there's one thing in our life, I've had people in my own team of ministry that won't quit smoking. As far as I'm concerned, as far as we have come as a church today, smoking should be almost elementary. Come on, it's, that should not even be an issue. Come on, I mean, it's one thing to deal with issues of your own heart, but smoking, give me a break. That's a superficial, ignorant thing for somebody as a leader to have to have a problem with. If you can't, and, and I love when people say, oh, I wish uh, God would just help me. He's been trying to help you. Yeah. That's the point of that. But it's an open door for the demonic oppression. And the cycle will continue until somebody in a generation will say no more. Generational curses only continue until a generation finally says no more. I love when people say, well, my father dealt with this, my mother dealt with this, i got to deal with this. No, you do until you say no more. Come on. How many know God can break generational break, breakthrough in your life? Here's some patterns that take place in a Christian. Most Christians have this in their life sometime or another. Wounding, negative thinking patterns. Sometimes we think ourselves into wounds. Come on, we think ourselves to hurt. We think about something long enough, we get hurt. Come on. Sometimes I'll say something like, even the tag team preaching that God told me to say, this one and this one and this one was going to be tag team in, in, the re, in the revival in the days ahead. And the person that thought they should be included in that was not included for a specific reason, and, and immediately the enemy begins to cause their thoughts to get negative. Come on. You know, all you got to do when you don't have power is plug back in. You're not part of it. All you got to do is plug back in. But the enemy causes that pain to come from our thoughts. Sin and disobedience comes. Darkness, demonic oppression. Life happens, and we make decisions from our own pain. Whether or not 
We are going to leave a cycle of pain for the next generation. See, we got to understand something. I don't know about you, but I don't want my children to experience the things I've had to experience. And what I think is so awesome is I have seen and walked in deliverance for so long that I've, I have seen people get set free that are 40, 50, 60 years old and their children get set free of the issue that they get set free of. You know why? Because it's a generation no more. Come on. I don't want to leave a cycle for my next generation. I don't want my son or daughter to, to grow up at, at, at age 15 and begin to have things upon their life because of things I didn't deal with. Come on. I don't know about you, but that baby's breaking pencils as soon as it comes out. Something like that anyway. Life comes in cycles. First we're born. God, I love the way he laid this out, so I have to do the way God laid. First we're born. Oh, the joy of the goo goo God God days. Come on. How many know when you're first born, there's not much going on? We just get curious looks and we might get a little gas and and you know we might dirty our diaper, and, but it's just a it's a goo goo god out days. Yeah. Come on. Next we enter the toddler area, and I'm telling you the season of learning distinct word no. Come on, how many know that's the first major word that a toddler learns? Yeah. No. God showed me as I was doing this sermon, if a three-year-old gets mad when we say no, they didn't hear it enough when they were first starting to be the toddler. That preaches. <laughs> Stage three is the drama king and queen, the pre-teenage. Come on. Trying to figure out when they, when and where they're going. All oh, the dread of the the premenstrual girls. Come on, no one truly does understand those wonderful adolescents, young adults, the phase of independence. How many know independence tries to start in the teenage years? Either we begin our career choice or we leave or cleave to the person that was just made for us. Come on. You just wait about five years and you will wish that you have just eaten them up before they left the nest. Because after just about five years, the person who was calling on every word out of a parent's mouth was cleaving and close and hugging and embracing, yeah. now is distant because now their life has begun. And the cycle that they started, they're starting with their children. Yeah. And they begin to understand real men and women, womanhood. It's the next phase, my house, my rules. Every parent says the same thing, it seems like, that the last that the, that they, they heard from their own parent. You live under my house or my roof, you're, the, that's my rules. It's like, wait a minute, that's what my mom said to me. The cycle. I'm saying this for a reason. We find ourselves married to the person we dreamed about in the last phase, but now we have children. And the ultimate quest of manhood to produce after our own kind. Then comes the golden years. Fine, I'm fast forward and fast, ain't we? Hallelujah, we was dirty diaper, goo goo, ga ga, now we're in golden years. 
that, that we dream about. Responsibility to care for the children is over. They're gone. Hallelujah. They're on their own. You have planned for retirement. And, and your wonderful spouse are going to live the dream of the RV ride. As you look back on your own personal cycle, if it looks anything like one that I just talked about, what did you do to impact the world in that cycle? Most of the world, most of the church, the cycle doesn't include impact. We're growing up. Even the children get forgotten in the church. When history is written, written about you, will, what will it say? Come on, they wrote in the Bible about, about those men and women of God. What would be written about you today? I don't know about you, but I've, I've thought of that many times. What if they wrote a book about me in the Bible? Will they remember the hunger and desperation I had for God, or would they remember all the mistakes I had to do to get there? I heard a saying one time, whether you live good or bad, live it to be a memory. Come on. You want to leave an impact. Yeah. I'm not sure I agree with this but who needs another bad memory? Come on. But I understand the underlying principle to live so that your life will never be forgotten. There's certain teachers in my life that just were left a mark on me. Certain coaches in my life that left a mark. Even a Bible school teacher left a mark on me. Brother Denny left a giant mark on me. Other prophets made a mark on me. And probably don't even know it. A scary thought is that someone would be remembered for the pain. They have caused others. That they brought into somebody's life. Yet it happens every day. Judas will be remembered forever. Because of the thing he, the choice he made. Everything he did up to that day is not even remembered. I preached a sermon one time that had, a, that had to do with the good life of Ju Judas. There's not much in there, but there is some. Come on. People were all upset, saying we should not remember anything that has to do with good. But the whole point of it was this man led a life of potential and blew it in one day. He lived to betray the greatest example of love to ever come to human form. Is there a memory of Judas? There are so many people that because of our proneness toward negative thoughts remember only what they did 
rather than their potential and who they were created to be. Some people are leaving a mark on this earth of having promise after promise after promise after promise given by God, and they have never lined up. Some people are getting in their elder years and still have fulfilled anything. Do they think they're going to leave a mark with their little prophetic word in the church every couple of months? I'm saying there's something that we have a bigger call, a bigger picture than our own little world. I don't care if I get recognized in the same sentence as somebody like Billy Graham or Smith Wigglesworth. But I do care that I do leave some marks. Many of us are not living out our greatest potential because we have absolutely no clue what it is. In prophetic meetings, we used to minister to everybody after every service. And whether I was a speaker, I was always on the prophetic team ministry. People would come up, what am I called to be? That's all they wanted to know. Am I a prophet? Am I evangelist? Am I a pastor? Am I a teacher? They didn't want to know anything else. Come on. And even if I told them, they still wouldn't have a clue. We have never known because no one has ever really spoken in our life the way that we really need it. We are blessed in our ministry. God's continually speaking to us. A lot of revivals that's going on right now, that's one thing they are missing, is that rhema prophetic word. Many of us, even in this room, have grown up in some kind of abusive home. It's caused us to be comfortable with abusive family lifestyle. Come on. You think that this is just life or your lot in life? I don't think that the creator of life ever intended for our lives not to be something good. Come on. How many believe that God didn't create you for something good? God created you for something good. When the Father created us, He had a plan. A plan for a hope, a future. Somehow along the way, the image became distorted. The love was exchanged for pain. Some people are living a lifestyle right now from pain to pain. The last two nights at the revival, somebody shows up. Somebody shows up that was desperate on the inside of their spirit and was impacted in a desperate way. That's what revival is supposed to be. Every week. Not just one, but many people. Come on. You know why? Because people are going from pain to pain. And when God speaks into that, it begins to cause that which they have been made for to come alive again. This is why so many people need to hear a prophetic word about the same thing seven times, seven different ways. The pain leaves at wounds and scars that sometimes just cannot be forgotten about. So the pain turns into a cycle of behavior, patterns 
that in turn cause us to become pain for those we love. Hurt people hurt people. Anything, and I was going to say this, whether or not my family showed up this morning, even when my mom hurt me as a little boy, I knew, even though I had no reason to know, I knew there was reasons why she did what she did. My mom today is not even remotely close to the mom she was at 25, 30 years old. She's been delivered and set free of monumental things and now really is a mother. It's amazing some people have to live into their 70s before they realize. I lived in a home where love abounded, but my parents outwardly were not as successful. How many have ever been in some kind of home environment where they would say how much they loved you as they abused you? Come on. Whether it's physical, whether it's emotional, whether it's verbal, sometimes getting punished for things you had no business to get punished for. There's times I did things by accident and would get beat. Come on. Trying to hit a golf ball one time, I, I, I missed the golf ball and hit my cousin with, in the head with the golf club. Bunch of stitches all over his head. Accident. He said it was an accident. I got beat pretty bad for that. Pain transferred pain. Pain in the person gives pain to another. I had a very dysfunctional behavior cycle that caused me to recycle the pain from my family. When we look back at this cycle of pain, it starts with the pain of a wound in our lives. We see that most of our woundness can be tracked back to our love deficit. Somewhere where we did not have love, somewhere where we didn't really truly have a love impact in our life, that's where the pain came from. A person only can handle, listen, being wounded so many times before their ability to receive love is totally dried up. That's why some have come to this ministry and had to go through layer after layer after layer after layer to get set free. I've told the story many times. I would be ministered to prophetically two times a week, sometimes every week for over 10 years, and I would bawl almost every time. That's how much had to be peeled out of me. Wounding can cause us to start compacting our hurts and emotions and feelings. Usually by age 35 or 40, the areas we have found our pain to begin to leak out in our relationships and personality at 35 to 40 years old. All the pain of our entire life leaks out then. You know why? Because we can't handle it anymore. It has to come out. We can't push it down no more. Some of you need to think about your lives, and that's when it was happening, wasn't it? Come on, this is God. I don't, ha- I don't have to have some kind of survey and some kind of medical doctorate. I know by the Spirit. We start leaking out our own pain, and it begins to come up on somebody else's. God's given us some characteristics of wounded. I know most of us in this room have been set free of so much. But there's always room for more. Come on. God, you just get it all, get it all of it. Come on, don't leave anything behind. I want all the dust bunnies. Come on. I don't want to save anything for later. 
I don't want that child to receive anything bad of my life. So here's the characteristics of wounding. Number one, withdrawal or isolation. Come on. A lot of times when you have a wounded spirit and something flares it up, we withdraw from everyone and we isolate ourselves. Some people close themselves in their bedroom. They close themselves. Now, I understand that if you have, that's kind of how you're living. That's beside the point. But we still have a cycle of this. We close ourselves from everyone. Come on. We begin to cut ourselves out from people thinking that others are not safe and they are our source of our pain. This is a form of controlling our relationships. We cut ourselves up and we actually control the relationship. Sometimes we do this when people are trying to get close to us. We close ourselves off. Come on. Because we're not used to hearing the words, I love you, from somebody who really means it. Number two. It's kind of similar to number one. Walls of self-protection. Come on. Come on, we're going to get set free today. And so is whoever ordered the CD. Walls of self-protection. Guarding ourselves from further hurt. How many know sometimes we end up guarding ourselves from hurt, we guard ourselves from love too. Fear of man, past wounding, can cause us to lose trust in our relationship with others. Come on, this is powerful stuff, and this is truth. Don't you love it? We're having a good time this morning. God's doing all kinds of great things. The glory's here, and then all of a sudden, God's ripping our hearts out again. Just because you're going through the manifestation stage of transition does not mean the love of the Father doesn't finish the dealings. Preach it. Number three, possessiveness. Bonding only to one or two people. Feeling threatened when others try to enter into the relationship. Come on, I've had male friends that are just male friends, my friends. And I, I'll have two friends. And man, if we invite another brother, you'd have thought I asked for a kidney. What's he coming for? It's like, I don't know, balance out the car. They feel threatened. When others try to enter into relationships with our one to two, at times this leaves the one or two with feelings of being smothered. This can lead to an emotional dependence on relationships, possessiveness. I'm telling you, there's even people in relationships today, I'm telling you, and you need to hear this. There are people today in relationships that have a friend, sometimes even opposite sex, a guy that just is friends with a girl, you bring somebody else into that relationship. Come on. And there's trouble. It gets mixed feelings. You think I'm feeling jealous when you're not. All of it, all it is, is some wound. Number four. These are powerful. I would say this is only for the CD, but control and manipulation, control and manipulation. Deep inside, we become insecure with other people because of past wounding. We have to be in control so our life will get better. If we can't control, 
then we cut out intimacy to protect ourselves. Control and manipulation. If we're not in control of the relationship, we're out. Some of you have been rejected by people that you were close to because, if they, because they lost control of the relationship. So you had to leave. Preach it. We got a lot of these. We're not done. Ha <laughs> ha. And then we got some other stuff too. Hey. Number five, difficulty in receiving correction or instruction. That's a definite problem. We must trust a person to receive from them. When we have been wounded, we tend to harden our hearts and refuse to submit to any authority. We can become very opinionated and demand our own way. I used to have a real problem with this. Really? When I was in the workplace... I may have had bosses, but I was in charge. Come on. Very rebellious about authority. Tell me what to do, and I still did it my own way. Hallelujah. I had to learn the hard way. I needed set free. Number six, difficulty in receiving or giving love and acceptance. Some of you might just want to get your checklist and do them all. We must feel secure with a person in order to love them. But wounding has caused them to feel insecure with most people, so they cannot receive them. Our heart may have become so hardened by the wounding that we choose not to express our emotions and feelings. I'm going to pick on my wife for a second. But when she was at my church and God gave me a, he spoke to my heart and he told me to tell everyone that every time you see her, to hug her. Because God said it was going to break a wall that she had up. And man, there was a few people that they made a habit of it. Long embraces. Some people need that, and that's the only way the wall is going to come down. It did work. It did work. Exactly what God said. You say, why? Because we shouldn't have our walls up to every relationship, every person. Come on. Number seven. Need for constant attention and recognition. Most people have a need of praise. If not given, then we might withdraw from the relationship. Constant attention and recognition. Come on. Got a lot more to go. (laughs) <laughs> You're going to need more paper. No, sorry. Number eight. Some of these are intertwining. But how many know that's what wounds and pain does? Intertwines with one another. Number eight, to feel unloved. When we are not valued in our relationships, we begin to feel betrayed. We can easily become suspicious of others This can be set up for more rejection and blame shifting. We feel in love, and all of a sudden, there must be a reason. Big conspiracy. Must be doing something. Number nine, self-centeredness. Life and conversation focuses more on our needs, causing a victim mentality. Some of us, all we have is needs, and that's all we want to focus on. 
Anytime I've dealt with some people over the last year, and sometimes when I try to deal with something they're dealing with, they'll begin to tell me all the problems they have. That's not problems that I'm trying to deal with. And it's just to get me off focus. It's a victim. Well, I have a hard time. Oh, praise God. Hallelujah. Get set free. Number 10, a pattern or broken relationships. It's either a pattern of brokenness or of relationships or broken relationships. It's fear of man that causes us to become people pleasers, not saying what we really feel. Saying what others want us to want want to hear, really. Because our dis, uh, because of our distrust of others, and I meant distrust. That is not the right word. Distrust of others in relationship. I'm telling you, it hinders us from bonding in an emotional, healthy way. Broken relationships is a very powerful thing. I'm telling you, some people that's all they have in their life. Broken friendships, broken uh, uh, relationships of all kinds. All you can see is a pattern. You can usually see this pattern with a lot of people. One broken relationship after another. Number 11. Find identity in a group. We're going to have a hard time finding who we are in a group. Finding our acceptance in belonging to a group can lead us to becoming trapped in a group. We try so hard to get into a group that we get trapped. Come on. Such as a drug culture. Some people get into the drug activity because they just want to belong. Homosexuality. Some people just want friends. And even they'll accept homosexuality, and the next thing you know, they are homosexuals. Like, I'm kidding. Rebel groups. What do you think all the terrorist groups get? People who want to belong. Come on. You will go where you feel you want or are wanted. We find it hard to lead because we have learned how to follow more than lead. It's finding our identity in a group. Number 12. Whew. I didn't realize how many there were. I wrote this. Hallelujah. Judgmental attitudes. I think this is awesome. How few of us are here this morning. How much God's saying. Out of, it's a judgmental attitude, and out of our wounding, we begin to build ourselves. We build ourselves up by putting others down. Come on. That happens all the time in the church. We surround ourselves with those who, we, who agree with us because everybody else is wrong. Here's another example of woundedness. This one probably will shock you a little bit. Lack of intimacy with God. You say, why? Because we blame God for the wounded. For us, our feeling toward authority is transferred to God. Our relationships with God then are based on the service because we are trying to, to, to be loved more. We serve more than relationship. We think God's going to love us because I'm cleaning the church. I'm doing this. A lot of people who serve in the church aren't even close to God. Some people have wanted to work for my ministry that are very good workers, but they don't have a good relationship. That's why they're not working for me anymore. Come on. They can work circles around most of us because that's how they work. But the relationship, they don't have anything. Come on. Got to get that wound took care of. Number 14. Last one of this section. 
fears and phobias. Wounding has led us to fear of man, rejections, and feelings of, of being a failure. You're only a failure when you blame others for your mistakes. Come on. I would rather try to do something great for God and fail. Yeah. And not to try. You've got to try. That's how you know if you're going to do it. People that make a lot of mistakes are people who do a lot. Come on. Now I'm going to preach a little bit longer. Come on, it's almost noon. I've got to hurry. Anxieties and panic attacks can begin here. Why? Because being wounded can cause us to shut ourselves off to love. When we shut ourselves off to love, the stronghold of thought is built and it exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Did you hear that? The strong, that's why the Bible says to bring every thought to the obedience of Christ. Because our stinking thinking controls us. There's some good scripture in 1 John 4.18, 1 Corinthians 3.18. We choose to believe the lie that nobody loves me. I'm unlovable when the pain comes from our life. You know, a lot of times the reason we're not loved is because we're not lovable. Come on. Nobody loves me. Well, would you love you? I mean, think about it. Whenever we feel that way, usually we are pretty hard to be around. People walk on eggshells around you. And we feel at the same time, nobody loves me. Exactly. It's not that people doesn't want to love you, but sometimes it's hard to get in. Well, some people could just see their self. And because we don't feel loved, and because we don't feel like people love us, that's when sin and disobedience comes in. Giving to others what has been given to you is the personal anthem of many hurt people. I have received, now I give unto you. When we make a choice to deliberately hurt another person, it's a sin. Come on. It's a sin. There's no mincing words about it. Are you ready? <laughs> then we try to hide by denying that we did anything. We tend to respond to different roles. Number one, victim. Some respond by playing the victim. Some people over this last few months have tried to say they're the victim. Come on. As a victim, we are incapable of dealing with wounding, so we give in to the pain. Wounding then leads us to feelings of loneliness, to deep inner pain, to feelings of self-pity, to possible depression, to despair, to life without hope, finally to thoughts of life being too painful, and we wish we could just die. Victim turns into the spirit of death. How many know that's what God wants? There's a lot of mighty men and women of God today that are playing the victim and dying. I've had people standing right beside me ministering the powerful prophetic word died prematurely 
because they fought, fell into this. I have gained a lot of wisdom over this last 38 years. And people need to take advantage of it now. I don't preach this stuff without experience. Here's number two. A persecutor. Come on. People become a persecutor. As a persecutor, we will fight against the wounding through negative emotions and resentment, which leads to bitterness and in turn leads to hatred. Hatred leads to rebellion against anyone, everyone, and everything, thus causing us to live a life as an abuser, rarely acknowledging the need to change. Some people become a persecutor. How many know you, we can recognize some people in the church has walked in this? Some of us in this room have walked in this for a time. But by the grace of God, we got ripped out of it. Come on. Isn't it awesome God rescued us out of this mess? Because these things are true ways of leading into destruction. Here's another one some of you probably don't think really fits, but it does. A rescuer. Number three. A rescuer. You say, why? Because wounding creates a dip, deep Inner agony, the rescuer will struggle against the wound and become indifferent to the hurt. We will take a superficial happiness and recognition for, for being on the spotlight. We try to help others and it gets the focus off us, our own self. Come on. Some people become a rescuer. We can become a uh, 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 talkative, loud, aggressive. We enjoy the praise of men through our own accomplishments, overcoming crisis. Through our experiences, others can also be helped out in the situation. And often we have no, uh, uh, we have no need for healing because we have overcome our pain through denial. I'm just going to rescue other people. I don't have any problems. I've had people bring people to church that are messed up, and they bring them, and they're like, oh, say here, and they're like, come on, God, minister to them. I'm like, I look out in the spirit, and I can see that the person who brought the person needs more deliverance than the person they brought. They think they're doing this righteous thing, and they're really just trying to bring somebody messed up more than they are. Preach it. We need to feel good about ourselves so we can help another deal with their wound. Come on. Not acknowledging that the wounds can take us to a place of darkness inside of our own lives. Once we live from that place of darkness, we totally we are totally living from the flesh man. There's a whole lot of flesh men and women of God right in the church. For me personally, I think all sin comes from a desire to live or protect your flesh. Sin comes from protecting your flesh. In any case, we run to a place of isolation that I call darkness. I'm my own king and my own subject. In other words, our lives revolve around ourselves. Come on, this is the church I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the world. I am the center from which go out my thoughts. What can others do for me? I am the object and the end of my thoughts. They begin with me and end with me. My own glory is and ought to be my chief care. How many know this is people in the church can be like this? It all revolves around them. Some people come into the church like we're supposed to bow down to them or something. I'm here. 
This is how they sit down on Sunday morning. Come on. What's in it for me mentality? What draws attention to me? My ambition to gather the regards of men to the one center, myself. Me, 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 me. This is drawing the praise and recognition of men to myself. My pleasure is my pleasure. I live of my own comfort and happiness. It doesn't matter how it disappoints and wounds another. Some pastors fall into this. It's all about them. They want the pedestal. That's why it hurts such a body of Christ is when a pastor gets lifted up too high. Come on. My kingdom is, here's how they continue. I've got to spend a lot of time on this, and there's a reason why. Because it's all surrounded a spirit of pride. My kingdom is as many as I can bring into the knowledge of my greatness. My former church. That's what happened there. It was a knowledge of the greatness of the person still there. My judgment is the thoughtless rule of things. This is how I interpret them. Whatever I think is right is right, and everything else is wrong. Come on. Some people, even in our own former team, thought this way. Whatever they think is right, everything else is wrong. Come on. How many know you cannot follow a leader or be part of a leader team when you're the only one that's right all the time. My right is what I desire. My rights are what I'm in need of in order to enhance my position. What do I need to feel better about myself draws others to me. The more that I am all in myself, the greater I am. What is? I think I'm greater than I'm wrapped up in myself. Some people show up to church with an with a, with a exterior that looks like they're just wounded and want to be a part. But inside is what's different. It's all about them. They want people to see them. They interrupt me when I'm preaching. They're interjecting things because it's all about them. They want the focus on them. Come on, there's nothing wrong with saying, hey, man, and being in agreement. But I'm telling you, you got to understand, there's sometimes, there's some kind of spirit rising up. A lot of times we close our eyes to the, this fact. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man, come on, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. When we live for ourselves, we love Father God not for who he is, but for what he can do for us. That's a spirit of pride. We need to love him for him. Come on. When he comes and shows up to a house of God, things happen. We don't have to just have something for him to come. This is why some miracles still take place in churches where the leader has no relationship with God. Because God does it for the people. Living from a cycle of pain at the, at the core keeps us trapped in our lives and entanglements. We cannot 
just deal with one of the issues of cycle of pain. Just such as casting out a demon or dealing uh, with the woundedness of our past. But if we begin a process that deals with the root issues, we can get rid of the behavior. Come on. Some people can get rid of generational curses. Get devils cast out of them. And still have the roots. I used to have a rose bush next to my house. Don't know how it got there. Didn't plant it. Very annoying. The kind that climbs the walls. I would cut that thing down to nothing. Cut deep down into the ground. It was next to the foundation, so I could only go so far, as far as I could go. Usually a year, maybe two later, it would be all the way up the wall. The same thing I just destroyed. That's what a lot of Christians look like today because they don't ever deal with their own roots. You know what roots, one of the major ways to deal with roots is acknowledging you have the issues. People that are not with us right now are people that said, I don't acknowledge I have anything. That's the difference. If you really are accountable and submit to a leader, and you really say, I want to submit, then, and if you really trust that he hears by the Spirit of God, and I walk up to you and I tell you, I believe you're dealing with this, how many know you should be praying about that? Come on. Don't just say, oh, I don't believe it. I don't really have a problem. Come on. I believe that my greatest battle has never been with a demonic power. It's been with flesh of men. Come on. I can get rid of demons left and right. I cast out demons like nothing. But if the flesh... Man, that's the hardest thing in the world. It has been my choice that I have made out of comforting my flesh that have most often hindered me from growing. I want it my way. Satan is defeated. How many know that doesn't work that way? If you want it your way, Satan just got a stronghold. The blood of Christ took care of this. So then why do we continue to see defeated people and defeated in the church? I love when somebody comes to me and I'm preaching about the demonic realm and stuff, and they're telling me, they come up to me and they go, the blood of Jesus has already took care of all of this. We don't have to deal with this today. flesh that's why we have to deal with the demonic realm today because we invite the devil the devil has no power I agree we give him access Satan has a plan constantly bombarded us lies deception for us to embrace them Apply them to our lives. The way for us to continue to mature in the Lord is to bring truth, to admit, hello, my name is Bill. I have a problem. Come on. The church, we're so blind to our own stuff. Some people have come to me when I don't think they had problems. There's something with me. Just deal with it. I look under the hood and there's nothing there. I put put them on the lift. I had Paul on the lift one day. I couldn't find anything wrong with the shocks. 
But I would rather somebody be over-examining than to be somebody who says, I don't have a problem. All right, in closing, I have some questions to ponder. Number one, <laughs> what? Oh, back off. She's going to ask a question. Hallelujah. Can you identify some of the wounded areas of your life that have left you dealing with pain? Number two, name three characteristics of the wounding. And we already went through the characteristics. So all you got to do is name three. Just, just three is all you got to name. <laughs> name some of the negative thinking patterns that you can think of that caused you to close your heart from receiving love or giving it away. Number four, where was the place you ran for refuge from the pain, abusive behaviors that unleashed on you? Remember, some people run to worldly things to numb their pain. Come on. Even pornography, people actually use that to cover their pain. Come on. Overeating can be a cause. Not to mention alcohol and drugs. Number five, patterns that comprise areas of negative thinking and darkness in a person. Which ones can you identify with as a part of your life? Do you have other ones that you could name? You say, oh, this sounds like homework. Come on. You really want to deal with everything in your life? I really encourage this stuff. This is like God gives you prescriptions. You can go home and have a ball and mess with yourself. Number six, final one, closing, last one. Can you remember a time in your life that your pain may have caused an area of darkness? And can you forgive the one who brought the pain? Let me give you a, a heads up. That means you have to forgive them. <laughs> and if you have to, as I said before, if you have to put my name in there, that's fine. Just forgive me anyhow. Hallelujah. You say why? Because we're closing the cycle to pain. We're closing the cycle to pain. Come on. I don't know about you, but it's time. It's time to finish it. I don't want it to come around again. No. Come on, there's things in you you don't want to affect men. No. There's things in me I don't want to affect the child. I don't want to affect my household. No. The buck stops here. <laughs> come on. And there's no greater feeling than freedom. No greater feeling. Some of us don't even know what freedom is. So this morning, I already know we all got something. Come on. Something somewhere in this fit you. So what I want you to do is we're going to play this song I never told her about. And we're going to get rid of it all. Yeah. Whatever it is, you're going to lay it down. And what I want you to do is we're going to, I believe we need to kind of get up and respond to this as an altar mm -hmm. and let the Lord know. Let, allow him to take his magnifying glass over you. For every nook and cranny to get rid of the last morsels. Some of it might be need of a shovel. 
Some of it might need of a spoon. But whatever it needs, it needs for a reason. Because our cycle causes us to respond differently in relationships, in church, in ministry. It gets intertwined in every aspect of our life. And we don't want to be in that cycle anymore, do we? Come on. So this morning, we're really going to be breaking free from the cycle of pain.
It's amazing. In the normal life of a, of a, of a child of God, how much can pile up against us. You are taking the ammo out of the enemy's gun. You're taking the thought that the enemy has used against you out of the way by responding today. God is setting us free just more. And this is the type of teaching, and I really, I really mean this. I'm not just trying to get a CD sale that you play over and over and over until it's gone. It's one of those things. You might want to pause it and deal with that issue and just go over that one and then do the next one. I think it's profound that God gave us so many different points, so many different things, because he doesn't want to leave anything. Come on. See, what you don't understand is now that we're in the manifestation stage, we go to a higher place. Our junk can't go with this. Come on, this is a pivotal time, a critical time right now. And God brought us, here, brought us here this morning to get us set free. And I really know by the Spirit of God, it, no prophetic word can do what God does on the inside of us. Yeah. This is powerful. So, Lord, we just receive it. We say yes. Uh, we say yes. Have your way. Mend our brokenness. Set us free, God. Cause us to come alive. In Jesus' name. Lord, don't let up until we deal with everything. Please, Lord, don't let people lose focus after they leave this place and kind of forget about it. Make this a homework that they take heed to because we really need to remove every cycle of pain. In Jesus' name. So, Lord, we just cleanse this place of anything that is not of you. We take it all out. We send it out to the dry and inhabited places. And Lord, we seal this this morning because this is it, man. We seal.